welcome everyone to this incredible session on creative industries and refugees. My name is Lorraine Charles and I'm the Executive Director of NAML and one of the co-hosts of the Migration Summit. We're really excited to have you here today. The Migration Summit 2023, organized by the MIT Refugee Action Hub, REACT, NAML, Karam Foundation is a month-long convening designed to build bridges between diverse communities of displaced learners, universities, social enterprises, policymakers, employers, and governments around key challenges and opportunities for refugee and migrant communities. This year, we'll be exploring the theme, co-creating pathways for learning, livelihoods, and dignity through virtual events, hosted by participating partners all around the world. During this session, we will explore the potential benefits of the creative industries as a pathway to employment, as well as barriers that refugees and marginalized communities may face when seeking employment in this field. Our expert panel, calling in from Kenya, will provide guidance on how to navigate the job market in these industries and share insights on how to overcome these barriers. I'm going to introduce you to my really good friend and colleague, Ville, um, who will moderate the panel. Ville, is um is Creative Industries Program Director, Finchurch Aid, and he'll introduce the other panels and, and guide you through the session. Welcome, Vile. Thank you, Lorraine. Hey, so today we are speaking about creative industries as a pathway to employment for refugees and marginalized, com marginalized communities. Um, and I've invited three creative experts with me uh, that all have very different perspectives to the topic. Um, do you know, to help us understand if creative industries really is the next big thing then that can employ masses or is this all just empty hype? So uh, with me today are uh, Joy Mwangi. Uh, Joy, maybe you can wave your hand. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Joy is a multiple award-winning CEO and co-founder of Kenya's finest animation studio at Animation. Um, and before founding at Animation, Choi has also produced multiple TV series, Lee uh, led marketing departments for various businesses, and, and also she's been a prominent figure in, in Kenyan creative space. And to make all us uh, almost 40 year olds bad, she's managed to do all this before turning 30. Welcome, Choi. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, we do have Platwell, uh, Pl Platwell Robinship. Um, can you also wave a hand so, so we know who you are? Um, so Platwell is a designer and overall creative genius from Kenya. He's worked uh, as a designer in Kenya and various agencies and as a freelancer. Uh, Platwell has founded Jenga Culture, which is a creator space uh, helping upcoming creatives accelerate their career growth and be ready for the world of work. And lastly, we have um, Samuel. Uh, you might need to uh, assist me with the, with the surname. But Samuel Kitinji, uh, who is a yeah. young animator, <laughs> I got it right. Okay, yeah. so Samuel uh, is a young animator from Nairobi. Uh, he used to work as a street vendor before joining FCA Creative Industries program last year. And now he's currently doing his internship with Ada Animation. So we'll be focusing um, on Kenya and Africa as a geographical context. And we'll... we'll um, uh, explore the topic from kind of potential benefits of, uh, of creative industries as a pathway to employment. We'll look at the barriers there still are uh, um, in employment uh, in this sector and how to overcome those barriers. And finally, you know, what we are already doing in this space. And then we leave some time for questions uh, at the end of the session. So feel free to add any of your questions to the chat, we'll, we'll address those towards the end. So I would like to tar target Joy with my first question, which is uh, what are creative industries and what are the potential benefits as a pathway to employment for refugees and marginalized communities? All right, thank you, Will, um, and such a lovely introduction. I think um, I'm so honored to be on your platform to talk about things I'm passionate about, young people, job creation, inclusivity, and just to be able to give a few numbers so that we can understand what we're talking about. If you look at Africa's population, we currently sit at about 1.3 million um, 
actually 1.3 billion people. And when you look at our access to mobile use, uh, to mobile uh, devices, we're talking at around 500 million people and access to internet sits at 30% of the population. Why is that important? Because the creative industries are propelled by those two things that I have mentioned, mobile devices and internet. But still the continent sits as the one that has the highest rate of unemployment. Now, when we talk about opportunities, and in my field, we talk about animation, and I give you more numbers, the animation industry globally is valued at around 300, um, yeah, $325 billion, and Africa only realizes 0.075% of that. Now, what that means is that there is an opportunity to be able then to create around the creative industry, and what that means is just economic activities that are boosted by creativity, knowledge, and talent. And so in the creative industry, that's what we talk about, intellectual property, and those are the assets that we have. So then you did ask me, what potential opportunities lie for us, especially in the marginalized communities, and those seated um, as a class set of people who then are either not included, and that's this inclusion, but also a disadvantage on a social, political, and economic level. So I think number one is skill development. When it comes to lack of education and training, being able to get the right skills to be able to do animation is very important. And remember, creative industry doesn't just encompass animation. It talks about film, it talks about music, it talks about fashion, architecture. So I think there's one, skill development. But second is economic empowerment, because once you've attained the skill, then you're able to acquire the jobs that you can do to be able to revenue generate. And the third thing that tends to open up around the same area is entrepreneurship, where yes, you have the skill and yes, you're able to get a job and work in a studio like Art Animation. But number three, you can actually start your own studio. But number four, and that's very interesting, is about uh, social empowerment, because remember, marginalized communities uh, sit in a space where in this one um, environment, you feel disadvantaged. But we're saying we want to tag and play with you in the workspace. And so being able to work with someone, for example, has been so delightful because it means that every day he leaves his environment and he comes to an animation studio, which is maybe kilometers away from where home is. And so then he continues to also identify himself and build his own identity and confidence within the creative industry. Thank you, Joy. Yeah, the, the numbers are quite incredible and, and really describe the, the potential. So, so the potential is there. So, um, Flatwell, would you have a take on, take on this, this topic as well? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Bill. Um, glad to be here. Um, yeah, I think same question my understanding of the creative industry, of course, uh, I would share what many of us understand, uh, basically a spectrum of economic activities that uh, involve the buying and, buying and selling of creative and cultural goods and services. And of course, that includes, you know, the arts, design, fashion, film, etc. cetera. Um, and of course, as we progress uh, through time, we are seeing newer ways of self-expression, uh, especially among young people. Uh, Joe has given very good numbers, especially looking at uh, African continent, which is the, the youngest continent. Um, and, you know, people looking to explore different ways to express themselves. And so all these are, you know, uh, opportunities uh, for them to uh, make money and, 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 you know, sell these goods and services. And the buyers of these goods and services uh, are wide ranging from, you know, small and medium sized enterprises to nonprofits, companies and corporations, faith based organizations, governments, et cetera. And so when you think about opportunities for, uh, you know, people in the creative industries, you're looking at two categories of people. Number one is the creative himself someone who, who is either born with creative talent uh, or, or learned certain creative skills. And secondly, are people who don't consider themselves creatives, but also work in the industry, including, you know, accountants, marketers, you know, business managers, et cetera. And so uh, there are opportunities for these two categories of people. And so it's to ask ourselves, how do we open up these opportunities for them? I think that's why we're here to, to discuss that. And the reality is that the opportunities are there because, um, you know, through time, currently we are talking about advertising being 
the biggest consumer of creative services, among the biggest consumers of creative services, and that is driven by commerce, right? Um, other drivers include technological uh, advancement, like Joy had mentioned. So if you talk about uh, technology, uh, we, we're seeing people beginning to express themselves through TikTok, uh, through uh, social media, etc. And so it's to ask how do they convert these forms of expression into financial or economic gain? Um, and I think we are going to talk about that a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so it sounds like the potential is definitely there. Um, you know, we all, as you mentioned, the technology is there. We also, you know, uh, the continent is at uh, getting better internet networks. There is more access to connectivity. Uh, we also will see um, streaming giants such as Netflix coming to the continent, which kind of, to me at least, hints that they are expecting to make a lot of revenue in the future. But still, you know, if if we look at um, global market share of Africa in, 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 uh, for, for creative industries, still very marginal. So I'd like to lead us to, to the second segment, which is uh, talk about barriers to employment in the creative industries, um, and especially for refugees and marginalized communities. So Samuel, um, I'd like to first ask you, so what kind of obstacles um, people from your communities may face when they try to access employment in, in the creative sector? Uh, hi, I'm Samuel again. Uh, maybe to answer your question, Will, I can give you a short story, a bit of history about myself and how I got to the creative industry. So uh, I'm from Makadara constituency in Nairobi. Uh, Makadara is in the east side of Nairobi, where we have mostly estates that are slums and some are semi-slums. So I am 26 years old. I have lived all my life in Nairobi. So I graduated high school um, in 2015. And fortunately, I, I lost my father the next year on the month of April, which was just one month after the KCSC results. So this affected the education plan of bridging a course in any of the big universities in the country. So uh, since my, my mother was the one left as the breadwinner of a family of four, as a man, I had decided to uh, find any job that did not require advanced qualifications in order to help support the family before we come up with a uh, plan B. And so Juakali industry, to me, is the mother industry that accommodates both literate and semi-illiterate employees. And that's where I got my first job as a salesperson in a, in a big market in Nairobi called Gikomba. So the job, we used to sell couch fabrics. And I worked up there for about seven months, earning a basic salary of around 8K. Then moved to another salesperson's job. Um, I worked for a few months, shifted to another job, uh, Coco Coco Cooker Company. So uh, to summarize, Juakali industry is how I survived and uh, was able to maneuver for the seven years of, after graduating high school. So uh, things were not getting any better. I finally tried self-employment in the Juakali. Well, for those who don't know Juakali, Juakali means hot sun, hot sun. So these are jobs that you, work, that you do under the hot sun. So um, <laughs> uh -huh. I, I began, I began, uh, I began as a, by baking bread and buns. And I used to hawk around the market selling my products, then saved up some money and uh, bought a small trolley, a Mayai trolley. This is uh, where you keep your boiled eggs and sausages to keep them warm. So I used to start selling as early as 7 a.m. all day, and um, I closed my business around 8 p.m. So these are 13 hours of work, you can imagine, of sweat and for peanuts. So at this point, I was like, something has got to give, man, you know? And the education plan B was also not coming as well. So uh, that my eye business was the one I, I was doing right before I had about FCA training from my friend. Um, and to me, this was a golden chance for the longest time. Uh, my mom advised me 
that in life you're going to get golden chance once. If you miss it, then you wait for a silver chance, which is not as good as the gold one, of course. And if you miss that one as well, then you maybe wait, so you'll get maybe the bronze chance. So to me, the FCA training had to be the golden chance for me. And that's how I came to meet all these mind-blowing, amazing mentors and trainers. So uh, just to point out what happens to most of our youth today, especially the youth from Islands, where I grew up, you find most of our boys and girls graduate from high school, barely. Then after we dive into Jua Kali jobs, because these are jobs that are readily available for the youth because of the minimal requirements. And uh, yeah, so technically that's what happened for me. Uh, so even for the ones that maybe are fortunate enough to join campus for their degrees, most of the university graduates end up doing jobs that are, don't even relate to what they studied in campus. Like, for instance, I like to use my older brother as an example. He's an excellent mathematician. He got his degree in statistics. And since he graduated four years ago, he has been working as an Uber driver. <laughs> so it's mm. really a pandemic for my country, the case of the employment rate, if I can, if I can say that. Um, yeah, so if I can maybe continue. So uh, yeah, sure. why, I joined, why I joined FCA. Uh, so sure, sure. Uh, why I chose 3D animation course and left my, my eye business. Well, I am from a generation where cartoons became popular as we were growing up as kids. We had TV stations such as NTV, KTN, where cartoons from Cartoon Network, Walt Disney, all, all you know, across the world. So these cartoons used to air on these channels. So I was one of those kids who would never, ever miss these cartoon shows. Um, I loved cartoons so much. I remember I used to get in trouble with my parents because of drawing cartoon characters on my father's newspaper at home. Um, I used to draw cartoon characters on school textbooks. I got in trouble so much, my parents had to buy me a drawing book. So all through my early education, I identified as an artist. And I was actually good. I was actually good. So uh, as I got older and got a general idea that cartoons are actually animations, which basically is an illusion of movement of still images that depict life, you know, they become alive. So this is what I knew I wanted to learn how to do, but not as a career yet, because um, I still had no idea animation could become a thriving business. Uh, so it was just for the passion at the time. The idea that I would be able to create my own cartoon movie or cartoon series that my friends and I could enjoy was enough for me to, to want to join the training. So, um, so uh, the possibility of recreating moments that my friends and I shared in the past as, as now an animation film was inspiring also. And, you know, animation basically for me was a limitless world of possibilities. So um, also animation was special for me because I am an, an introverted, in, introverted kind of individual. Um, when it comes to my social life, I'm usually a quiet guy because most of the content that fascinates me are content many would label as, you know, kids' content, in quotes. And this made me somehow indifferent, if I can put it that way. So uh, discovering that there's a world of people like me who share the same taste for art was fulfilling because animation has existed not more than 15 years in our country, if I'm not wrong. It, can't, it, it, doesn't, it hasn't existed for more than 15 years, it's still new. And so this explains why animation is still a mystery for most in my parents' generation. Uh, it's why the mindset of my parents' generation only recognizes people who are lawyers, doctors, teachers, and engineers as the only payable profession. So I, FCA was going, so going through FCA was an eye opener for not only me, but for my mom as well. And the fact that it is a course that costs an average of 150K 
that's around a thousand dollars for a certificate and about 300k that's about two thousand dollars for a diploma uh yet fca was giving the training for free so for uh, for the same certificate so this was also one of the main reasons i joined fca um of course um names like joy mwangi and michael mutiga and um these are big names in the in our country that inspired me to dive into this area it gave me a bit of confidence that it was a strong foundation for a career and um looking at our neighboring country there's a there's an animator called Raymond Malinga um from Uganda um he he is the one who came up with a short film called Akalabanga Akalabanga it my homework and uh looking at his story <laughs> as well uh this was assuring for me so my mindset since uh, how i can say fca um the training and the opportunity i've gotten the way it has changed my life my mindset has definitely changed definitely um remember i didn't see animation as a career i have learned how marketable it is to be an animator in the creative industry i learned that you know working as a junior animator at ad animation there are a lot of new organizations that need animation to explain maybe their innovations in a much comprehensible or better way um there are already big existing organizations especially after the covid-19 pandemic uh that realized they needed to have a digital presence so as animators we help these organizations target the digital world um visualize their objectives you know advertise their products and services in a new fresh way in our country <coughs> sorry for my voice i'm a bit <laughs> no worry <coughs> so thank uh, you thank you samuel oh, oh you, yeah. you, you still have, yeah okay uh, yeah so i don't know maybe if i can say um what uh what you know creativity comes in a natural way but uh I can I I I can assure you without the training and this opportunity I would have never been able to translate my art into a source of income. Uh, yeah, so uh if I I've said a lot. I don't know if I've answered the question. <laughs> no, no, that's no, no, fine. Thank you Samuel. Well, that that was super powerful and I I personally can't wait for to see when you turn your stories into into animation. movies uh, i'm sure that that day will will come uh so a uh, flat will over to you like knowing that you also share a little bit similar background uh with samuel how how did you overcome barriers you know becoming um creative professional in kenya um thank you villa i'll i'll try to be as brief uh so number one is to say that uh something i forgot to say earlier is that uh, one of the things about the creative industry is that it it typically has a low barrier to entry meaning that um, often times when you have you know your creative skills like samuel has um, you can easily take them to market uh, and people will buy now um i have a background i i, I grew up in a in the re- the a similar region as samuel uh, eastern nairobi they call it islands and typically you find many uh, slum and semi slum uh, peri urban areas uh, in that area uh, also characterized by you know crime uh, high rates of crime and uh, you know drugs and things like that um and so the big question is whether that affected me in a way um uh, probably yes it did but here's the thing i how i see things is that uh while we would people would like to refer to slum areas as marginalized areas um of course because um maybe many of them do not have access to some of these opportunities while that is true at the end of the day uh it still boils down to certain fundamentals so here's how i see it um i think that uh the first set of barriers we w- we could consider is internal barriers uh including you know uh, you know lack of self confidence uh you know lack of initiative you know people are not aggressive and i'm very glad to 
to know that Samuel was aggressive enough, of course, uh, even though he didn't start in the creative industry, uh, just to get out there and to, to get work done um, in the Juakali sector, um, which is uh, basically uh, an, another way of saying the informal sector. And so I think internally, uh, there are those barriers that sometimes people set for themselves. But I'm assuming in the event you can overcome those barriers as an individual creative, then beyond that is to ask what are those systemic barriers that exist that come in the way of your practicing your creativity and making money. And I think there are very many, including, you know, access uh, to opportunities, um, uh, you know, uh, inadequate infrastructure, um, whether we're talking about refugees or marginalized uh, communities, many of them do not have uh, adequate uh, access to this, access to markets, uh, limited access to financing and capital. And so, by and large, yes, uh, systemically, these are things that some of them are at, an, at a disadvantage about. Um, in terms of my story, I would say that um, I don't think uh, that completely deterred me. Of course, it put me at a little bit of a disadvantage. However, over time, um, you learn to work harder. Uh, if you're if you're not able to get the privileges that probably other people are able to get, um, and you're able to work, um, you know, a little a little smarter, and so it it takes um, internal uh, preparation. All right. So the root causes are many, um, but at the end of the day, it's also about uh, overcoming internal barriers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Flashbo. Uh, it's encouraging, encouraging speech. Speech. Um, so someone was actually asking, "What is FCA Creative Industries Program?" Which is a, <laughs> which is, or, or what is FCA Program? Which is a fair question. We we <laughs> forgot to mention that. So we are all involved in in the same program, uh, which is organized by FCA, which stands for Fin Church Aid. Uh, we we work in Uganda and Kenya. We are focusing on. Um, skills training in digital creative industries. Uh, for example, at the moment, we train in Kenya animation, graphic design, web design, and digital marketing. Uh, I will share some uh, materials for sure later on. Um, okay, so on to the Joy. Um, Joy, so you are an employer in the creative industries. What kind of what kind of skill sets are you looking for as an employer? And if you think about the talent now in the you know that's coming from the FCA uh, Creative Industries Program pipeline, um, how far are they from being really potential employees for your company, providing added value? All right. So I think I'll pick up what both Samuel and Floodwell have said. Um, first, I really love that yes. The highlight around entry into the creative industry is low. So the willingness to learn and the willingness to groom the skill you already have is a step one and is a great place to start. I think while I did not come from marginalized communities, I wanted to be a DJ when I left high school. And so, you know, of course, being a woman and just the DJ in the industry, my mother was going mad. And she says, hey, why don't you go to school and see what you can do? And that's how I got into communication. And the first place, and I loved what someone said, my first job actually was at KTN, which is a lead in media house in Kenya. And I used to be the one who cues the cartoons that uh, Samuel was watching. And one of the biggest needs I had was, while I am buying cartoons from out of Africa, why don't I share content that Samuel can watch and relate? And I'm glad that that inspired him to get into the industry. And that's what inspired me to start an animation studio, to tell African stories. But I didn't understand the depth of the magnitude um, of what we were trying to do, because one of the challenges we had, of course, was to be able to get the capacity. Now, expensive fees don't make it any better for those who are interested to pursue animation. And so when we start programs like FCA, where we're, we're saying, hey, we will take the burden financially and get sponsors to give you an opportunity to pursue your craft, that in itself is a powerful statement from FCA. So I think for me as an employer, as I run a studio, 
I'm saying, hey, the first thing is I need you to have animation skills. So we're talking about understanding of animation principles, talking about the techniques, talking about user software. And of course, with COVID, what happened is we became a global village, right? And so now we got resources that allowed us to get access to courses that were ultimately free. So it means that, yes, while you are starting from somewhere and from a disadvantaged place to say the need and I, I, in Swahili, tunasema kujituma. So in English, that means um, really being aggressive to look for skills and look for opportunities that are around you. So someone had to get out of his comfort zone to find this program where he can really try and craft his, um, or really craft what he calls, you know, his skill and his passion around animation. So I think that, yes, I'm looking for animation skills. I'm looking for technical skills. So if you look at softwares, for example, and that's the other challenge, we're using uh, Adobe Creative Suite. We're talking about uh, Cinema 4D. You're talking about Autodesk Maya. Now, such softwares are very expensive. We're looking at probably roughly about uh, $3,000 per year. And so some can't afford that to buy a license. So what happens is we end up cracking the software to be able to use it. But when you crack software and you create an asset, for example, you can't come back and put it on YouTube because Autodesk will say, hey, where's your license for that, right? But now we have alternatives like Blender. Blender is actually a free software where, and it's what we use in the program to be able to ensure that, yes, once we've given you the training on how to use it, we're also setting you up in a space where as you go back home and finally you've accessed a laptop and you can access a software that will enable you to be able to say, yes, now I'm really learning my craft. The third thing I'm looking for is creativity. So I think part of what, uh, when you look at refugees and much marginalized communities. We talked about the mindset and I love that Samuel talked about internal um, barriers where it comes to even things like confidence. Are you confident enough to say, hey, I have an idea and I think it's viable. So I'm looking for creativity, someone who's looking outside the box. You're not just conforming to what we're watching on Disney. I want you to be original and authentic. And the fourth thing I'm looking for, of course, is where you're able to network. How do you gel around culture? And remember, in marginalized communities, you're working with a minimal, you know, supply of things. And so you're saying, hey, I need to conform to how my environment works. But when you come to this space of the the studio and we're saying, look, diversity, we're talking about, you know, thinking out of the box. So culturally, how are you growing and developing yourself? So you did also ask me part B of the question, you know, when we look at the um, graduates from the FCA program, how far are they from the industry standards? I mean, I would not even put it at FCA program. I'd put it as a continent. I think we are far from where, you know, the industry standard is. Why? Because first, we've not gotten our voice and bearing around our own design. So I think many animators are saying, hey, I want to create a Frozen, right? When you look at Japan and what drives the anime industry is because they decided they wanted to create what they called their own around their culture. And they are the biggest drivers of their own economy. Now, I give you a very interesting fact. Um, The United Nations Conference for Trade and Development in 2020 gave us a creative economy report and said that the value for Africa is about $25 billion. uh, Actually, $25 million, not billion, sorry for that. And when you look at the refugees, UNHCR is saying in 2020 that we have about 20.6 million refugees, and they come from mostly the big numbers are from Uganda, from Sudan, from Ethiopia, from Djibouti. Djibouti having 47% of their population made of refugees and marginalized communities. Now, what even strikes me more when we look at women in within the refugee spectrum, they're saying that in Africa, 48% of the refugees are women and 52% are children under the age of 18. Now, when you look at animation and how women participate in Kenya, I think I'm the only woman who actually runs an animation studio. And in the world, we're saying that women only participate by 20%. So I think that, yes, as Africa, we need to pull up and there are a few things that we can, I'm sure we'll talk about it that we can do to set ourselves up to where the industry standard is, including access to training and infrastructure, access to networks, um, access to financial capital, 
access to being able to, you know, where is, for example, I'd love to learn how do you do an end-to-end production? I've watched Frozen, I've watched Luca, I appreciate it, but we ourselves really don't understand. So when it comes to collaboration, again, being able to see how do we collaborate and not compete because we are too small a number to compete amongst ourselves. But the quality that comes out from FCA is very encouraging because Ad Animation is training with FCA to ensure that, yes, those who we set out into the industry are not just getting the soft skills, they're getting the tangible skills to give them a fighting chance to make a difference within the not just animation, but the creative economy and the industry as a whole. Thank you, Joy. Uh, yeah, strong points. And I, you know, what I really appreciated uh, as a program director uh, about your kind of approach has been always to understand that, you know, hey, let's not use these expensive softwares Let's not train on this because, you know, what happens after the training, these students cannot access them. So let's always find that kind of, in a way, a local and possible solution and, and go by that and see, see where, where it can take us. Um, so, OK, obviously, we, we've, had, we've had already a few success uh, stories here, but Flatwell, you, you uh, shared with me an interesting success story from someone who, who really overcame barriers. Uh, you know, uh, starting from very humble uh, background and and getting get, you know going all the way in the in the creative space globally. So, w- would you like to share that with us? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's actually two people. Um, they are a couple. Um, so uh, just one of the many stories that we have from this part of the world. Um, there's a a, a a brother to a friend of mine. He's called the Yema Caliph. Um, I think I'll share, I'll share the link to his story on on the uh, on the chat. Um, and so Yama Khalif is originally from Kibera slums. Uh, I'm I'm not sure about this, but I think it's the largest slum in Africa. Uh, okay, I would say at some point it was Soweto, South Africa. I don't know whether Soweto is considered a slum anyway. Um, so Yama comes from that part of uh, of, of, of Nairobi uh, slum area. And so, of course, you'd consider uh, that a marginalized area, uh, of course, disadvantage, et cetera. Um, and then eventually uh, they get he gets to meet uh, a refugee from Ethiopia uh, who currently um, he's married to, uh, who is called Howie Awash. Um, and so they meet and in the context of, uh, you know, what they're doing in, 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 in Kibera, um, they, they meet this uh movie star uh can i remember her name um the the lady who is the mother to wonder woman i can't remember her name um so she runs this uh ngo which she started uh in kibera called human needs project and through that they get to meet and then and this is a good example of someone, uh, a creative person given an opportunity. So he was given an opportunity to uh, move to the US um, and, and to study there. And he went there to 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 do um, some, some course, I think, in communications and media uh, at Dominican University. And over time, currently, where, where they are at is they're running a very huge uh, fashion uh, outfit in the US called Yamakalip, and they do a lot of uh, of work with it. They also come every year. They they come to Kibera slums to provide opportunities to younger fashion, uh, you know, artists and designers uh, to showcase their work, to model, etc. So at the end of the day, one of the things that I see here is yes, uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, and I think uh, Joy has, has has talked about it. It begins with overcoming the internal barriers, and then, uh, of course, uh, hopefully, uh, get that uh, way out. And I think that's where we, as as a as an as a community, talk about nonprofits, governments uh, can come in to provide those opportunities for you know for for these people to break out and and to showcase their work. And when they are given a chance, many of these marginalized community slum areas are known to have incredible talent. Uh, many of these uh, refugee communities have incredible talent, so definitely they need opportunity. And whenever we give that, that opportunity to them, you would be amazed at what they can be able to do. And 
these guys are doing incredible work in a in a in a land of course that's uh riddled by racism and all that but they're making it big yeah great great that's uh, that's yeah. uh, encouraging uh, so obviously, FCA Creative Industries Program, we are already an initiative supporting uh, communities, um, um, refugees and marginalized communities to access uh, um, access education uh, in, in the creative, creative industries. But would there be any other initiatives like this um, that would be worth highlighting, uh, Flatwell, if you can continue? Um, yeah, I think there are a couple, um, of course, apart from FCA um, and and particularly for refugees, I think most of the programs would be run by INGOs. Um, I started an initiative myself um, called Jenga Culture. Jenga Culture is uh, a nonprofit social enterprise. We run a hybrid model that provides uh, opportunities to uh, creatives from Kenya and with an outlook on Africa. Um, particularly emerging young creatives, uh, not just to, you know, build uh, livelihoods and economic resilience, but also uh, to find ways to impact their communities. So social impact is one of the things that we do at Jenga Culture. One of the things we are uh, running right now is that we provide a, a couple of training programs um, in beyond, we, we, we imagine the beyond creative skills that uh, you know, emerging creatives would need. Uh, they also need extra skills, like for instance, financial management. So we la- we run uh, courses in financial management for creators, um, legal awareness, so that they understand how to navigate the you know the the, the legal uh, you know minefield that is the creative industry. Um, beyond that, uh, in the next uh, couple of of, of weeks, uh, we'll be rolling out an initiative we call AFARA, which is basically an opportunity for uh, particularly very talented creatives uh, to get opportunities for work. So basically connected, connecting them with our client partners uh, to provide opportunities for work. Um, and we are looking to collaborate across the, 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 the board uh, with private sector, with uh, government, with, with, with uh, you know, uh, Nonprofits, etc., so that you know these young people can provide can get these opportunities uh, that they definitely need. Um, I think there are a couple of other examples I could give, uh, and I think after this, probably uh, we can share this uh, on the on the chat. Um, I'll I'll share that list here with us so we can can have a look. Thank you, Flavio. Um, hey, we are slightly behind schedule, but that's okay. Um, I'd like to ask Samuel, like a simple question. In short, how has the creative industry program changed your life so far? Uh, okay, uh, like I said, um, first of all, my, my, my mindset has definitely changed. Uh, remember, um, I was someone who didn't see animation as something that can become a career. So I, I got to learn how marketable it is to be a creative as an animator personally. And, um, you know, I learned about the, the presence, the digital presence that uh, is that became very crucial for organizations and corporates uh, since the COVID-19. And this has been a big opportunity for the creatives uh, I can say it's, it was a blessing in disguise, and um, it uh, I have come to to learn how to 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 translate my art into a source of income, and um, I have obviously gained an advanced technical skill that I that I to a level I didn't think I could. Um, so I can say I'm a symbol of inspiration to my friends back home, to my siblings, and. Um, I can say I'm a source of mentorship. I have gained a tool. It's like I've gained a tool uh, that can enable me now to be self-employed as a 3D animator, as a 3, 3D animation tutor or mentor, or even as a freelancer in the country. Uh, be- before, before I only knew the world around me. Uh, I only knew the people around me, meaning possibilities in my head were limited to what people around me were able to achieve. So the exposure I am getting now 
for example, talking to you guys in this meeting, uh, likes of Joy, uh, Vil, Wacklin, and um, <laughs> Vladwell Rawinji, all this, if you asked me a year ago that if this was something that was possible, I would honestly laugh and I tell you that this was a network you can only achieve with the help of a, of a godfather. So uh, it's, this is truly life-changing and I am so honored to be able to have these guys around me. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Samuel. That was again very powerful. Um, so, um, Joy, so what do you think? What are some of the initiatives or support systems that could be helpful for refugee or marginalized junior talent to access work in the creative industries? Yeah. Um, first, I, I really want to tell someone that, yes, you are deserving. And the more I continue to meet young people like Samuel, um, I really stay encouraged that because you have a dream and you continue to pursue it, you know, I say when the stars align, then opportunities begin to open up. So, yes, you sit here because you deserve it. And yes, you are enough. And I can't wait for you to open your own studio. And I think some of the supporting initiatives that, yes, we can do to be able to support such um, young people, including even my own studio. If you look at how we met uh, FCA was because we run a capacity building program two years ago. We didn't have any financing. And I remember my partner and I put in all our life savings to be able to make the program affordable and it was actually free. And so, so far in two years, we've been able to train 150 animators from five different countries in Africa. We're talking South Africa, Nigeria, from Tanzania to Ghana to Kenya. And so it's encouraging that, yes, when you then partner with NGOs and other stakeholders who are saying we can't give the youth a fighting chance, then we can continue to um, come up with things like workshops, and online trainings, and that's what we're talking about, capacity building on a hybrid level. And COVID enabled us to see how then do we make it inclusive. But you see, when you talk about um, hybrid, we're talking about software support, hardware support. So that means capital. We're looking at uh, grants and scholarships. And so if I look at someone's journey, for example, so step one, he's been able to access the training that he needs. And step two, he needs a laptop and software to enable him even after the training to go ahead and, and learn the craft a bit more. And after that, he needs a job placement, for example. It could be an internship, it could be a job. So partnering with such stakeholders enables young people to get them the right avenues where they can groom their talent. And after they've gotten a job, of course, it's a networking and we know networks take you far. And so all these guys on the call, I know someone has a network somewhere. So when you look at how do you partner with such people, it helps them to propel their craft. And overall, when you talk about then working with government, and talking about parastatals, then it gives something like uh, Jenga an opportunity to reach to many masses, right? So I think the, those are some of the things that we can do to continue to propel the young people and encourage them, not just them, but also the stakeholders who are at the front line to be able to create such services for them to access at the most affordable fee possible. Exactly. Yeah. What, what I take from that is, is pretty much like access from different perspectives, uh, like access to education, access to training, access to infrastructure, access to connectivity and, and access to networks, of course. Um, okay, so uh, I'd like to open up um, a floor for questions. So so if anyone has any questions from the audience at, at, at the moment, so now it would be a great time to ask them. Um, someone had a question about setting rates. Um, Theo, that was your question. Um, let me find the question. How do you set market rates to allow you to have a decent a decent wage? Because fees are always a challenge. Mm, I think this goes to, if I understand correctly, uh, you, we are not talking about the training program itself. We are talking about, or as we a, are. A, no, as a designer. As, as a, a designer. Writer. Yes. Okay. Maybe Samuel? Oh, I, oh. So, as an animator? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, ca can you repeat the question again, please? How do you set fees to make sure that you have a, a, a decent wage? Okay. Uh, so, um, for, for instance, now, for animation, because uh, I've, I've learned the process and it takes a bit of work. So uh, 
I personally charge um, like 30 second video in, in uh, for animation video, 30 second video for, uh, for about 20K to that's 20,000 Kenya shillings to, to 40 Kenya, depending on the negotiation and depending on the client, if it's uh, from a corporate or from an organization, definitely the prices are a bit higher. If it's from an individual, we can negotiate about 15k to 30k for that second video and uh if if you look from my story this is i am like i will i would be earning like five times four times the amount i was getting in a whole month in the in the juakali industry yeah well yeah um, um what about could, what about flatwell from, yeah. from a more, more kind of senior point of view um, thank you so much yeah thanks um i i think first of all it depends on a number of factors um internally you ask yourself what kind of experience you have so someone who's beginning uh will not be able to charge the same rate as someone who is who's been there for like five years so i'm imagining someone is a beginner um and then of course you look at other factors like um you know what ex- whatever you you're working on um the time it will take for you to create uh whatever you're creating um you know some jobs will take shorter than others doesn't necessarily mean that the fact that they they take a shorter time uh you know you'll charge less uh of course with with great experience you're able to to take a shorter time doing some work um but of course you're also thinking about the value whatever you're creating to this client. Um, and so certain clients are able to afford a bit more than others. And so it's often a balancing affair. Um, in one for, for one client, um, if they're able to, if it's a big corporation, for instance, um, and they're able to afford um, you know, a thousand dollars for a particular project, you would charge them that uh, even as a beginner. If it's a small organization, an SME in your own environment, you probably charge way less than that. And so it's a balancing affair in that. Um, um, so there are a variety of factors. And so it's not a one size fits all kind of rate. Um, I, I'll share on the chat um, a link to uh, a YouTube account, um, that a YouTube channel that trains uh, creatives on how to rate you know uh, create different traits for their work um i think that would be very helpful for people who are getting into the into this space someone called chris do i think um yeah okay i hope that uh, helps. thanks for that <laughs> yeah thanks for that. um by the way now i think we have uh, time for one more question and someone's asking for for links uh, our actually the FCA Creative Industries program website is just about to be ready, but our uh, social media channels are already out there. They are mostly, um, how to say, uh, moderated by by our own students. So it's uh, at least with the help of our students. So so you can follow kind of the daily activities in the program through through FCA Creative Industries program on Instagram. And I think we're also on Facebook and at least LinkedIn. Uh, Lorraine, if you have time, uh, please, please <laughs> go find the links. I, 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 my, my brain is not enough to multitask that at the moment. Um, okay, so yeah, we have time for one more question if, if someone is keen on asking. If not, I have one last question for for my panel colleagues. So, uh, what are the top five things that need to be done to develop creative industries into a sector that can employ refugees and marginalized communities at scale? Uh, we start with okay, Flatwell, you are on the screen, so so you have the honor to start. <laughs> Um, I think I'll share my, I'll put them in very briefly, five words. Um, number one, opportunity. Number three, sorry, number two, advocacy. Number three, financing. 
uh, number four, training, number five, mentorship. So opportunity, of course, uh, building access to opportunities, um, you know, expanding networks uh, for, for, for this, uh, you know, people to have access to training, et cetera. Um, and of course, advocacy um, to, to address all the systemic challenges that we have, engaging government, engaging other players um, in, in, the, in the industry to see that, uh, you know, we have equitable distribution of opportunity um, and all these challenges among them being, you know, uh, inadequate infrastructure uh, for, for, for creatives to, to do their work, you know, can also be provided. Uh, and of course, financing, training and mentorship, I think we've talked about that a little bit more. So, so yeah, those are my five. Great, great. Sounds good. Uh, next up, Samuel. Okay. From, um, from, from a graduate of the FCA training, uh, for something that I am currently experiencing, if uh, we, you can get someone who can create a, a cyber or like a hub um, where, the tra- where the graduates can continue practicing this new skill and build more on, the, on their portfolios because accessing quality machines is a challenge for most, like Joy said. Um, for those who can't buy, I think this will encourage the formation of teams on, of artists that can be the genesis of the next big thing in the country. Because if you have artists who are already skilled, um, meeting somewhere on a regular, I mean, this is, in itself is uh, already a studio. Uh, so this is, this is what I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. And Joy, uh, uh, last, minute, last minute is running. Uh, so... Yeah, your five words. All right. Um, I think there's a question I've seen. Um, and maybe Vila can address that because, yes, uh, Samuel and um, Cloudwell have also mentioned what was at top of my mind. Of course, just access, as we said, to infrastructure, to training, to networks, to financial, because at the end of the day, there's every step that needs that needs us to support in the animation or the creative film uh, pipeline. And the question here says... Um, you mentioned that you're currently the main or only female running an animation studio in Kenya. Are there any specific work that you're doing to encourage more female to join this field? Absolutely. Actually, I will give you a fun fact. When we do run our capacity building program, we look to have about uh, maybe 40% being women because already if I look at the what comes to run before, we only have about three women um, joining. So what we're trying to do on a personal level is to sensitize other women in the creative industry, not only just about the potential of opportunities they can get, but also to network and reach out. So I think it's um, if you look at it on a global perspective, it needs a lot of uh, pulling together as women and just being able to encourage and such conversations begin to open up because someone will say, hey, I heard your story and I too want to be um, an animator of sorts. And so then just walk in that, um, that journey with them. And so ideally, we will be setting up an initiative for women in not just animation, but we're looking at gaming, we're looking at virtual reality, because I think as Africa, we still have a while to catch up and being able to partner with women-led organizations that are saying, hey, let's empower women in the same way. And we know our challenges are different, not to say that um, men don't have challenges. I think uh, just being able to have those open conversations and showing them how. So I think that's the exciting thing um, for why in the position that I sit, be able to just share, 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 and be a sponge as much as I can to also learn as I am being able to give. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we are, uh, thank you, um, Joy, and thank you, panelists, and thank you, everyone at the Mike Racing Summit. It's been, it's been wonderful to share, um, share what we know uh, with you guys. And we've shared, I think, most of our uh, contacts are in the chat. So if, if you just want to uh, keep in touch, ask some questions, uh, feel free to, to connect. Uh, yeah. Thank you for joining us and have a beautiful Wednesday evening or morning or wherever you are in the world.